So, um, you know, the title of my talk, and um, this work was done by me and by my former student and um, postdoc, uh, Mohamed Sheriff, who uh, finished his work with IRS at the end of last year. Um, so my talk is going to be in three parts. Uh, first, uh, I will discuss the synthesis of zinc-based diffs. I will tell you what are diffs by mechanochemistry, and I'll tell you what is mechanochemistry. Um, so in this part, we use uh, zinc oxide. We mix it with a molecule called imidazo. Uh, through mechanochemistry, we get diffs and uh, water. In the second part, we're going to use those diffs and uh, mixed with um, a molecule called ferrin, in, uh, well, uh, including iron. Um, so we're going to um, take these two molecules and uh, pyrolyze them at uh, 1300 Kelvin to fabricate some planar structures involving iron, nitrogen, carbon, which uh, are used uh, as notable metal catalysts for the oxygen reduction reduction reaction. In the third part, well, I'm going to discuss precisely this uh, oxygen re reduction reaction in a uh, proton exchange membrane fuel cell. I've probably prepared too many slides, but you can stop me anytime. Um, so what are zeolitic and desolate frameworks? Um, they are a subclass of uh, metal organic frameworks. Metal organic frameworks are made of um, uh, metal, me metallic nodes, which are linked by organic ligands. Um, they are porous materials, as you can see on this example, and um, there are many um, uh, real uh, or potential applications to them, uh, such as catalysis, recapture, and uh, so on. Okay, so um, these are a kind of metal organic framework, and why do we call them zeolitic and desolitic framework? First, the word zeolitic, because they are very similar to zeolites, which are minerals that are found in nature. Zeolites are made uh, like this. There is a central silicon atom coordinate with four uh, oxygen. So this makes a tetrahedron um, like this. And when you assemble those tetrahedron, the tetrahedron, you can build a very nice structure, porous structures like this. Um, you can see at the middle there is a vacuum, so it's very porous. So uh, the, the ziffs are similar topologically to zeolites, uh, but uh, they are more complex. The building block is more complex. At the center, there is a metal atom. In this case, it's uh, zinc, and the uh, zinc is coordinated with four. Uh, there are four links with zinc, and uh, the links are made with uh, this uh, molecule uh, called imidazolate, which is a charged version of imidazole. So you see, imidazole in involves uh, carbon atoms, nitrogen, and the zinc is linked to the nitrogen atoms here, like this. And when you assemble uh, those uh, building blocks, you can get very complex structures, like these very porous structures. And uh, there are hundreds of possible topologies. Okay? We will consider only a few of them. But um, so th that, that's why it's so interesting. And now we understand why we call that zeolitic, immunosolate frameworks. Zeolitic because it's similar to zeolites. And imidazolate because imidazolate are the organic linkers that uh, uh, connect the, the metal atom near the zinc. So let's start with the part one. The part one. So the synthesis of zinc-based diffs by mechanochemistry. First, uh, what is mechanochemistry? So by definition, you can find this on Wikipedia. It's a branch of chemistry that deals with the chemical behavior of materials under the effect of mechanical action. Um, so we use a reactor. A me mechanochemistry reactor uh, looks like this or this. Uh, when I visited the McGill University where they work, they do a lot of mechanochemistry. Uh, I think I've seen this kind of reactor. 
So what you do, you put reactants. Here's a little square, a little triangle reactant, and you put metal valve inside. So then this reactor is shaking with a motor for minutes or maybe hours. At the end, you find something else. You find this. Um, so um, the advantage of mechanochemistry is getting more and more popular. Uh, the advantage is that it's green chemistry. You don't use any solvent. Everything is dry. And uh, there is no heating. It, it's done at room temperature. And uh, also, from the point of view of this, you can uh, synthesize uh, many var uh, great varieties of this um, at a cheaper uh, cost, at che very cheaply. Oops, sorry. Okay, so what are the, um, I, I will tell you what are the experimental results uh, done at uh, McGill University that uh, uh, represent the starting point of uh, our work. Um, so they uh, synthesized this by means of mechanochemistry, uh, and um, they used um, two kinds. Okay, so th this is this reaction. So zinc oxide plus two imidazole after mechanosynthesis, they produce zips and water. They use a special kind of uh, imidazole uh, where they include this group here, the methyl, the methyl group, and they use also this, this imidazole with uh, the ethyl group. Okay? So this is methyl imidazole and this is ethyl imidazole. So they mixed these uh, molecules with uh, zinc oxide and uh, the funny thing is that depending on the, the linker, on the ligand, they get different zip topologies. So for this ligand, they find the sod, the sodalite the topology. After that, they find an amorphous phase. After that, they, fi they find the carcinite. After that, the diamondoid uh, topology. Um, and uh, in this case, they first find the rho topology, then the anna, then the quartz. So, um, and uh, on this graph, they show the, the entropy, so the formation energy of those uh, zips. And um, the, the horizontal axis represents the reaction coordinate. This means that they observe those zip topologies at different times during the mechanochemical process. Okay, first they observe this, then this, then this, then this. So this is this was a very interesting question, and we decided to uh, think about it with uh, Mane. So this is our question: How to predict which zips will be generated from zinc oxide for a given imidazole ligand, and in which order? So this is a big question, a difficult question, and. Uh, so our first approach was to use the, the Oswald rule of stage. Okay, so uh, William Oswald was a famous uh, chemist who studied crystallization and the um, final discovered the rule of thumb, which is not a universal law, but um, he proposed, uh, this happens very often, that crystals, crystallization proceed in steps toward thermodynamically increasing stable more dense phases. In other words, you have first an un unstable phase with uh, very porous, then a uh, more stable phase, more stable phase, and uh, with lower and lower porosity. So this makes sense, because if we come back to the previous slide, you see that the energy decreases, and we know also that the density increases in this direction. So it makes sense, maybe we can use this simple rule to understand the, which zips can be generated in and in what order. So what strategy we use? Uh, so we decided to build computer models, DFT models of zips, by combining the six, the six topologies that we have seen in the previous slide, okay, these six, and we include also three more topologies G, SCAG, and NEB, and we combine these six, nine topologies with the two ligands. Um, so the, the methylimidazole and the ethylimidazole, and check their stability. So 
So I wish that it was removed by stability. So in other words, we have nine topologies with two ligands. So this means that we are going to calculate 18 different systems. Among these 18, there are six that are observed and 12 that are hypothetical. So we want to distinguish them, okay? So we will build all, the, all of them and see if there is some indication that some of them are real, are really observed, or purely hypothetical. This is our goal. What we expect, if we plot a diagram like this, the energy of the structure per zinc atom as a function of the density or packing index. Okay, here I define the packing index. Actually, we chose to represent uh, this quantity instead of density. The Kitai-Gorovsky packing index is defined as the volume of the molecules in the unit cell divided by the cell volume of the crystal. So the packing index is expressed in percent. So we expect that uh, the first uh, ZIFs observed will start from the northwest part of this, of this segment and uh, decrease toward the southeast segment of uh, the part of this segment. And uh, so optimistically, optimistically, optimistically we, we expect that the observed one, the green one, would follow this path, and the, the not observed one would have higher energy. So there would be a clear distinction. So the order of observation of those is, if we start here, we, it would be this one, after that this one. We cannot go from here to there because the, the energy would increase and this would contradict the, the Oswald rule. Okay, I have uh, prepared a, a slide on DFT, but I won't explain it because it's so hopeless to explain this in only one slide. Just to mention, you probably know already that it is a quantum, uh, quantum approach. And uh, I just would like to point out the fact that DFT is not an exact theory. Okay? It depends on uh, what is called the exchange correlation functional, which is something that will happen. And the following, you will see that we get different results depending on the functional we choose. The DFT models that we use, well, we use the software Siesta, which is uh, publicly available, uh, because it can deal with hundreds of atoms in a reasonable time. You know, our ZIFs uh, involve uh, hundreds uh, and even thousands of atoms in, our, in the unit cell. Uh, so we need the software that runs fast. Siesta uh, is good uh, on this respect. Also, we have to realize that since we're dealing with porous structure, we have to take into account what they have interactions. Okay? Because the, the, the atoms are very uh, distant from each other, and the long range forces are important. We have to do that. Uh, just to remind you, uh, typically the, uh, the interaction of, between two atoms uh, goes like this you have a repulsion region uh, due to the Pauli principle. Then you have covalent bonds and in the mid-range region. And then you have a long-range part, uh, which corresponds to the van der Waal interaction. And it goes as uh, r to the power minus 6. Uh, the potential, the interaction potential goes like this. But uh, in the framework of DFT, van der Waal interactions are included in the, the famous exchange correlation functional. Okay? We're going to try six of them. And uh, we're, we will also do a standard DFT, I uh, mean standard because uh, not including van der Waal interactions, and we use the well-known uh, PBE uh, uh, function. Okay, so these are uh, our results uh, um, gathered in a sync. My laser pointer is dying. Uh, these are our, all our results. So we used 18 SIFs and we, we uh, use uh, seven different functional. This means that we perform 486 calculations. Everything is there. Um, so this is for the methyl midazolic ligand, and this is 
for the EPU one. Um, in this picture, you see that the lanes uh, with uh, blue or green represent the observed this sub, cat, and dia. And in this case, it's uh, rho, ana, and uh, quat. And uh, the hypothetical represent, are represented by magenta or net. Okay. So first observation is that um, the general trend is, um, well, with a bit of imagination, you can see that the general trend is as expected. We go from the, um, so the zips are ordered like this, more or less. It's not exactly true, but it's not too bad. Um, so we see also a very significant difference between standard DFT, which are represented with uh, dark symbols, and uh, the Van der Waal uh, density functional results, which are represented by colored symbols. So the six last um, here, color, represent the Van der Waal calculations. So you see that the Van der Waal calculations for a given topology are well grouped. Okay? So uh, it's a good sign that uh, we did the calculation probably uh, correctly. <coughs> And also that there is not more, much contradictions between the different Van der Waal models. Uh, what we can see also is that the packing index for the Van der Waal uh, calculations are greater than for the standard DFT. This is normal. This is what's expected because the long range force will shrink the structure. Okay. So you see, for example, that here, this is, this has a larger packing index, larger density than for the uh, standard DFT calculation. And uh, also we found that all structures converge. Even the hypothetical structures, we could find uh, convergence for them. Um, okay, so now I'm going to uh, analyze more closely um, the, these, uh, these uh, results. And uh, instead of considering the six uh, Van der Waal calculation, I will consider only the, the red one. So the BH, because, uh, well, it gives the best agreement with uh, experiments, experimental data. Okay? So uh, this is exactly the same picture, but on, only with the BH uh, Van der Waal functional. The f and here I reproduce the experimental result. So what uh, the, the encouraging thing that we can see first is that the observed uh, this, the sub, the cat, and the dia have the correct origin uh, in agreement with experiment. Because you see the, the formation uh, energy of these this go from sub, cat, and dia. And here we have the same result for both uh, the F standard DFT and van der Waal. Okay? So this is a good result. Um, now, if we try to distinguish the paths, uh, in which order we're going to see the, the appearance of the different zips. For example, if we have to start with uh, the leftmost one, so the, the whole. Let's start with, okay, uh, standard. Let's see, uh, stand for both of them. Okay, so let's start with the whole. So according to the Oswald rule, we should pass from this to this, okay, we decrease energy, then to this, we avoid this one because the energy increases, we avoid cat, we avoid net, and we have to go here and then to quad. So the, and the same thing for standard drift. So what we find is that we have first O, G, sub, cat, and dia. So we see that the three of services are predicted in the correct order, but we have two intruders. The O and the Gis are there. Um, why? I don't know. We'll try to solve this uh, question later. Maybe it's a problem, uh, an experimental problem. So at this point, um, it's um, quite encouraging, but not fully. You see, the face is not fully accurate. Now, let's see what happens for the uh, ET limit isolated lithium. Again, the same picture uh, uh, with only the BH uh, van der Waal functional, and here the experimental result. 
again, we find that both calculations, standard DFT and barrier valve, uh, provide the right ordering for the energy. So we are happy with this result. But um, the following is uh, quite disappointing. If we consider the standard DFT result, we start from the low, we go to we have to go to the sub, then dia, then quat. Actually, we cannot include the ana. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> well, we cannot include ana because we would have to increase energy. Yeah. This is in contradiction with uh, the the Oswald rule. Uh, so you see that we don't have ana in this sequence, and we have two intruders, the sub and the cat, which should not be there. It's even worse for the Van der Waals calculation. Uh, here we have a row, we have a lot of intruders, we don't have an app, and we have uh, only the row and the quarks. So, so it's not very satisfying. We were wondering if our calculations were really correct, so we compared the, our predicts, our calculations with experiments. This is a big table, but I just want to, you to focus on the last two columns, which represent the measure volume of the unit cell, measure, okay, it was done at McGill University, and this is our calculation, our best calculation. So we did the Van der Waal calculation at 300K with uh, quantum uh, molecular dynamics, and uh, the number in parentheses, in parentheses represent the relative uh, deviation with respect to measurements. So you see that we are very close to measurements. Uh, the worst is the quartz. We always have little problems with quartz, so, but uh, it's not too bad. So you see that we are very close to the experimental result. And uh, I can also show you the lattice parameters and angles, and it fits well with the experiment. Um, if we look uh, more closely at the table, we can see also that uh, the Van der Waal calculations are generally better than standard DFT. For example, standard DFT at 300K has a 4.1%. Uh, you see, it's always higher. Um, and the Van der Waal, uh, Van der Waal calculations at 200K are better than at 0K. Uh, the, the reason is that the measurements were likely performed at room temperature. So we are quite confident that our calculations were done correctly. So why, uh, what can we do to answer our question? Okay, up to now, we didn't consider at all mechanochemistry, never. Uh, we probably have to introduce a, a concept with a new quantity besides energy, porosity. We have to introduce something related to mechanochemistry. And for this, um, we realized that in the mechanochemical process, there are very large pressures involved. Okay, Just by doing an order of magnitude calculation, like a physicist uh, like, like to do, we can estimate the pressure by the kinetic energy lost. OK, uh, let me explain. So, we have what happens in the me mechanochemical process. You have some pieces of materials stuck on the walls, on the reactor walls. For example, you have a piece of uh, ziff stuck on the wall, and you have a ball striking on it very hard. Okay, so there is something. Uh, something happens. There is. Uh, this is the the source of the transformation of the ziffs, and um, also. Uh, we, we intuitively we can understand that the strongest ziffs will survive. Okay, the absurd one will survive such impacts, while the weakest one will be destroyed. So, from uh, this uh, simple order of magnitude, uh, we consider that the it doesn't. So, uh, so the pressure here. Uh, will be given by the kinetic energy lost by the ball, uh, divided by the section of the interaction, uh, S, and divided by the distance, B, where the, the ziff is crushed. Okay? 
so if we and we know from literature that people measure that the average velocity of the balls are something like 10 meter per second and their mass is one gram one gram so if we put these numbers in this formula we get one gigapascal which is uh, well, it's a big pressure really a big pressure so maybe we should include the parameter describing the um, the strength of the crystal inside our predicted model. So the measure of the crystal strength that we choose to calculate is the hydrostatic pressure breakpoint. What is it? So hydrostatic pressure, you understand what it is. It's a uniform pressure exerted on equally on each side of the of the solid of the material. So let's start with uh, let's start with uh, a solid, a cubic crystal like this, with a small pressure. So there is nothing at it. But after a while, as the pressure increases in time, um, as the pressure increases in time, so the elastic constant will change, and uh, the crystal will start to distort a little bit. And after a while. Uh, when the pressure increases even more, there will be dislocation, complete dis dislocation of the crystal, and this is what I call the pressure breakpoint. Now, we would like to calculate this pressure breakpoint for all the zips, for the nine, to actually for the 18 zips that we have considered. We place uh, the FT. So here are the results of our calculation, or CMD calculation, for the pressure breakpoint. Uh, so the, this first set of results is for the methyl imidazolate uh, lithium. So what we did is that we apply a uh, hydrostatic pressure. Okay, here I write quasi hydrostatic because the pressure depends on time, also and also the fluctuations. So it's not a pure hydrostatic pressure. Um, and uh, we apply this, uh, so the time is here. Uh, we apply the pressure of 0, 0.1 gigapascal, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 gigapascal, then 1 gigapascal. And for each range of pressure, uh, we apply this for 1 nanosecond. So that's why we have uh, on the whole 5 nanoseconds here. Um, so for example, and uh, yeah. For the horizontal, the vertical axis, we have the ratio of the volume V calculated at the pressure P, okay, at this pressure here, divided by the volume, the initial pressure, minus one. So that uh, in our case, we start with uh, zero, okay? And after that, when you see that uh, the curve are decreasing fast, it means that the structure collapses very quickly. Um, we did two kinds of calculation. The black curves represent infinite crystal with periodic conditions. And the red curve represent clusters made of three by three by three in itself. So we applied hydrostatic pressure to these uh, structures and observed uh, when they collapse. For example, the whole structure is stable. Actually, they are all stable at 300 K for zero pressure. But for the whole structure here, you see that as soon as we apply a pressure of 0.1 megapascal, the volume decreases very quickly, meaning that the, the structure collapses uh, 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 to a large extent. This is the same for the GIS structure, uh, for the CAG, for the NEB, for the QUAT. Now, if I would ask you which structures you think are the more robust? You would probably tell me it's DIA, because you see the volume doesn't change at all with pressure. The second one would be probably CAT. Okay, you see that uh, there is a compression but no collapse uh, until one gigapascal. And uh, maybe the last one would be the sun. You see something happen near 0.3 gigapascal and something maybe even worse happened after that. But these are the three more robust structures. And if you agree with my choice, then 
These correspond exactly to the structures observed experimentally. Now I will show you what happens with the sun structure as we increase the pressure. So these are, this is the molecular structure of the sun for low pressure. You see that uh, well, uh, all the bonds are there. As we uh, increase the pressure to 0.3 gigapascal, you see that there, are, there is an instability uh, beginning. The structure gets compressed in one direction. And uh, if you further increase the pressure to 0.4 gigapascal, you see that several atomic bonds are broken. And finally, at 1 gigapascal, uh, well, everything is, uh, is, uh, fall has fallen apart. So the pressure breakpoint in this case is between 0.3 and 0.4 gigapascal. Now, what happens with the other ligand, the ethyl nidazolate ligand? Uh, everything is the same. Uh, so in this case, again, if I would ask you what you think are the most stable structure, you would certainly tell me that rho is the most stable. The second one is ana. Um, so you see that there are there is a decrease in uh, periodic steps, but um, there is something happen happening, uh, something here at point four. But before that, it seems that there is no sign of collapse. And the last one is the quartz. Okay, so as I told you before, quartz is a complicated case. So it seems to be okay for the, the infinite crystal, but the clusters seem to collapse earlier. Um, but I think you agree with me that these are the three most stable structures here. And uh, if you agree with that, then again, these are the structures which are observed in experiments. So in conclusion of this first part, um, I think we have answered the, the, our initial question, how to predict which this will be generated for a given mean curve and in which sequence. So what we have seen is that from the CMD calculations, we can just discard all the hypothetical structures which are given here in the magenta color. And we have to keep only the, the observed, the experimentally sub uh, observed uh, this structure. So here, the sub, the cat, and the DR, and here the whole, the ana, and the quartz, in, in agreement with the experiment. And also, we can predict in which order they're going to appear, because by following the Oswald rule, we know that we have to start with the sub, then we go to the cat, and then to the dia, and here the whole, the ana, and the quartz. So we are in good agreement with the experiment. Uh, of course, the amorphous phase is not included in this calculation, because we have no idea how to calculate such structures. Okay, the second part of my talk, we're going to use the ZIF structures that we have just generated. We're going to mix them with uh, this uh, nice molecule com called ferrin, which includes iron, very important. Uh, we will um, heat that, we will pyrolyze these uh, structures at 1300 Kelvin, and uh, as we will show, we get planar structures made of carbon, a graphene sheet, uh, including um, iron uh, a group, FEN4, in the middle. So these uh, simulations are very demanding. They are <laughs> very huge. So we could not mix everything and heat the system at 1300K. Uh, we realized that it doesn't work uh, because there are too many atoms. So we proceed in several steps. The first step was to, par the, to uh, investigate the pyrolysis of film. Uh, this is a quantum molecular dynamic simulations. So what is uh, film? It's this uh, nice uh, three-dimensional molecule uh, with an iron atom at the center, which is linked to six nitrogen atoms and uh, so the iron atom is related to three orthogonal planes, which are made of uh, what is called another molecule called phenotronin. So we have 
Tu fais notre une place. Tu as tout le monde fait notre une place. This is the, the basic structure of the theory. So what we did, we uh, used, we increased the temperature uh, in steps of two, uh, two, uh, 200 Kelvin uh, during 500 picoseconds for each step. We started at 300 Kelvin and then we increased the temperature until the, the, the structure is completely destroyed. Just to compare with our calculations with um, experiments, you see that uh, the, for failing, the measured values for the CC bond, CH bond, CN bond, uh, iron, nitrogen bond, are in good agreement with the experiment. So we're on the good track. The interesting thing that happens is that at the pyrolysis temperature, we see that one of the three planes of failing uh, goes away. We are left with uh, iron with two uh, phenolphthalene plane, and the third one well just goes away. And we have also some uh, hydrogen atoms that are detached from the carbon uh, from the carbon atoms. And as we increase further the temperature, you see that the molecule is uh, really destroyed. You don't see anything. So this is okay. So this is a. Um, a very important result that ferrin loses one of its planes to produce a planar structure. Okay, so we have the iron atom, four nitrogen atom linked to um, well, actually the iron atom is linked only to two phenolphthalein planes, and so forming a planar structure. The fact that this planar was important, very important for the follow. Step number two, we're doing a CMD with RAXFF simulations of the pyrolysis of this. So we consider two structures, the, the sod and the rho that we have seen previously, and uh, we repeat the unit cell three by three by two times, and the rho two by two by two, to form something like 2,000 carbon atoms. Uh, so you see that including the zinc atom, the, the nitrogen atom, and the hydrogen atoms. This makes a big simulation. And uh, actually, we could only uh, calculate the paralysis of this for five milliseconds. <laughs> Sorry, it's far from the experiment, because in the experiment, they, they do paralysis for minutes. But OK, in five milliseconds, what we've seen is a big mess. Uh, I, I cannot show that to you because you, you, it's not possible to understand anything. But here I show you an example of the, the sampling of the, the parts that we see after this five millisecond at 1300 Kelvin. So we see uh, so carbon cycles forming plant planar structures. A uh, few, cy few cycles uh, like that. We see uh, hydrogen molecules and nitrogen molecules. So in the last step, <coughs> okay, the last step of uh, the simulation. Uh, we will provoke reactions between uh, our uh, iron with two fiber uh, with those carbon structures. Okay, so we provoke the reaction. That is, we take, for example, a piece of carbon here. We approach this several angstrom from this uh, butterfly, and then we let the simulation take place. Uh, so what happened is that the carbon, the carbon like to form bigger structures all the time. For example, if we take this and we approach this to this molecule, we get this. In the second step, if we take this piece of carbon, we approach it here, we get this and uh, so on. So we imagine several scenarios where we get bigger and bigger structures. Actually, we think that this is what would happen 
if we could get a simulation, a simulation for several minutes or, or several seconds at least. So in the, during this process, we observed the, the spontaneous formation of different interesting structures. This one, for example, the FEN4 connecting two graphene sheets. If we continue to add, to, uh, add uh, some carbon pieces like this, we obtain this one. FN4 on the, on the side of a graphene sheet. So something up, interesting happened here. When we put these pieces of carbon, the carbon on the top just moved on the side and opened the structure to get this. Finally, uh, in the sixth step, if we include these two carbon structure from above, we get this and we get the FN4 embedded in a graphene sheet. We get another interesting uh, scenario. The beginning is exactly the same as before, except that in the third step, if we include a piece of carbon from below, we get uh, this uh, very strange structure where the, the iron has lost two of its nitrogen atoms and the carbon structure, the carbon structure restructuring to form this uh, well, this strange uh, arrangement with um, an isolated atom, carbon atom. So if we imagine that other pieces of carbon agglomerate to this structure from above, then we get an FEM2 structure embedded in a graphene sheet with scattered N atoms. Okay, so this, the conclusion of this part is that one important result is that during pyrolysis at 81300 Kelvin, trailing losses one of its plane to form uh, iron FN2, which is a planar structure. Then by combination of this uh, iron FN2 with carbon fragments, we got different kind of structures. This one, this one, this one, this one. And in the next part of my talk, we will check if these structures can be used as uh, catalysts for the oxygen reduction reaction. Okay, this is the third part. So we're using the catalyst that we have just modeled, combined, of course, this is the, the oxygen reaction, uh, reduction reaction. We, we have two hydrogen atoms plus oxygen plus the catalyst inside the fuel cell we have uh, the flow of electrons and protons, and at the end, we have two water molecules. Uh, I can remind you quickly what is a proton exchange membrane fuel cell. Uh, so this is a device to produce electricity. On one side, you include, you inject uh, molecular hydrogen. On the other side, you include molecular oxygen. And uh, on the anode side, uh, the hydrogen is split into protons and electrons. The protons cross the barrier, cross the electrolyte and the membrane to go on the cathode side, and the electrons flow and produce electricity. Uh, where, and uh, finally, the hydrogen combine with oxygen on this side, on the cathode side. And uh, the oxygen reduction reaction is this. So this is the combination of oxygen and hydrogen to form finally two water molecules. Okay, so this reaction, this ORR is very slow. Okay, you need a catalyst. So this is the, the entire purpose of this topic. Uh, you need a catalyst to accelerate the reaction. Here also, but here it's faster. You need, uh, uh, you don't really need uh, sophisticated catalyst. But on this side, we need one. And the best known catalyst is platinum. But as you know, platinum is uh, very expensive. So there is a lot of research here, in particular at IRS, uh, about finding new uh, catalyst, uh, which is not based on noble metals, okay, with inexpensive uh, materials like iron, as we have seen, iron, nitrogen, carbon. Okay, 
And uh, so we're will be interested in action that takes place here uh, on the cattle side. Okay, as an example, I will take one of the structures that we have generated. Remember uh, this, uh, the, the area in the middle in, in uh, the chain, the, the color, the nitrogen in blue color, the carbon in dark color, and the, the hydrogen in, in white. So we have generated this structure in our simulations of part two. Um, so this is the side view. Why I'm choosing this one? Well, because, um, well, many years ago, our colleagues from IRS, the group of Professor Dodre, imagined that this structure here was the, uh, the catalyst for the oxygen reaction, reduction reaction. The, they imagined that the whole catalyst was made by crystallite carb, made of carbon and that there were pores inside these, between these crystallites. Pores are very important because um, you now you have to uh, get a good flow of water, the, the water generated uh, uh, by the oxygen reduction reaction, and also a flow of the oxygen coming from outside. And this is another reason for using ZIFs, because you know ZIFs are porous structures. After pyrolysis, you get a very porous structure at the end. But you get also some catalytic sites made like this. Okay? So they imagine that in their science paper in 2009, they assume that, uh, well, the catalyst, the catalytic site was looking like this. But we were not sure uh, if uh, it was really a good catalyst or not. And uh, so this is something that we can check using DFT. Okay, how the reaction takes place. Uh, it is well known today that the, the oxygen reaction, reduction reaction at the cathode takes place like this. So we have six steps. So this is, you recognize our side view of the catalyst and proxyrin. The first step is the catalyst itself and uh, oxygen molecule. This is the initial state. The following state is the absorption of oxygen of this molecule on the iron atom. It's not too clear here, but it's the absorption of oxygen on the iron atom. The third step is the, uh, the combination of one H plus of one hydrogen, one H plus plus one electron to this um, oxygen molecule. So we have an OOH. The fourth step is the combination of this OOH with a new uh, hydrogen atom. So what we get is a water molecule and an oxygen atom uh, linked to the iron atom. The fifth step, fifth step is the uh, combination of this oxygen atom with an hydrogen atom. And the last step is the combination of this OH with another hydrogen atom to form two water molecules. No, no, there are four, four. You see the, um, here we have uh, the, the oh, okay, okay? we have four okay. electrons, four electrons, four okay? Electrons. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, but how do we know that this fraction takes place? That this fraction takes place? How do we know? Um, what can you tell, what can tell you that you go from here to there, that each step will take place. Well, we have to calculate the energy of each step. If the energy decreases, it's okay. So the reaction is thermodynamically possible. If the sequence, if the energy somewhere 
likes to go upward, then forget it. It's not a good catalyst, it won't work. So if I do this calculation, we, uh, we did that into last, I think. So for the, the structure I showed you, so we calculated the free energy as a function of the reaction state. So you see that we have uh, roughly a decreasing uh, behavior. Uh, there is maybe a little glitch at the end, uh, there is maybe, but okay, I think it's so small that it's not important. So this means that this catalytic structure is probably a good one. Okay? What's missing in this calculation is the activation energy. We don't know. Um, honestly, we tried to calculate that. It didn't succeed. Okay? So that's why I'm not showing that. What we can do is calculate the energy for each step. OK, now let's see for other structures. So we were very patient, and we did the calculation for 10 additional structures involving iron uh, and nitrogen. And uh, we also did the calculation for two more structures without iron, just to see what happens, involving only nitrogen. So the three uh, structures in the square rectangle are the ones that we have uh, observed in our pyrolysis simulations. Okay, uh, we, we utilize this, this one, and this one. Okay, so I will I won't show you the results for all of them, but I will show you some typical results and surprising results. Okay, so for the three first here, these are the ones that we have seen in our pyrolysis simulations. This is again the free energy as a function of the reaction state. So you see that this one, the FeN2 um, uh, group, provides uh, probably a good catalyst. This one is even better because you see that we have a decreasing energy, clearly, clearly decreasing. This one is a bad one because you see that the energy decreases up to there and well there is in order to go to the last step you would have to increase the energy so this means that the, the fifth step which involves the OH adsorbed on iron will likely poison the catalyst okay because it's it's really difficult to remove this OH group from the iron atom. Now let's consider a surprising result. These uh, two were not uh, observed in our simulations, but they're possible, why not? Uh, so this is uh, the Mercedes uh, uh, catalyst. Um, so you see it's a bad one. It's uh, almost as bad as this one. But what is surprising is that if you include the nitrogen atom here, then it becomes a good one. So honestly, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen without doing this induction. And the last one is uh, without iron. So, um, so what you observe here is that the step two doesn't exist. <laughs> that is the adsorption of the, the oxygen molecule doesn't take place clearly. Um, but the other steps seems to be okay. Um, so the fact that the step two doesn't seem to take place easily is probably the explanation why this kind of catalyst is not very efficient. It works, it's known that it works. If you build catalysts, carbon sheets with only nitrogen, it, it's known, it, it, it works, but not very efficiently. But these ones with iron are very efficient, very efficient, but okay, for a short period of time. So this is the big problem. These are good catalysts. It's a great uh, discovery done here in the group of Professor Degay. But unfortunately, they 
this catalyst and not stable. They work well for a couple of hours, then their efficiency, efficiency decreases quickly, um, and uh, nobody knows exactly why. So I'm concluding this part um, by saying that uh, several structures are possible catalysts, but uh, of course we didn't calculate the activation energy, and um, also we need to understand why such catalysts are not stable. Okay, they're good for a little while, but not long enough to be useful.